Okay, hello everyone. <laughs> Welcome to From the Experts, a webinar series brought to you by the Samir Foundation with a patient education support grant from Horizon. Thank you, Horizon, so much for your support. I don't think Dr. Levy needs an introduction whatsoever, but um, here is Dr. Levy. Today, we are very excited to talk to you all about and answer your questions about EvuShield in the setting of NMO and MOG. Um, and I just wanted to address a couple of housekeeping items. So the first is this session is being recorded. Um, it will be available for replay on TSF's YouTube and Facebook libraries. So you can access and reference this after the fact, no problem. And second, there is going to be dedicated time for Q&A. As I mentioned before, please populate your questions in the chat function or the Q&A function. We will get to as many of them as possible. And uh, without further ado, hello. It's great to be with Dr. Levy in Seattle. <laughs> Seattle. Everyone wants a piece of Dr. Levy here. All right, so what are the questions? So, you know, maybe we can start with what is EvuShield? EvuShield is an antibody. It's made artificially, and it's made to neutralize the spike protein. <clears throat> if you are unable to produce antibodies in response to the vaccine because you might be on rituximab or involizumab, then the thinking is that you would benefit from the drug like Evusheld that provides the antibody. So you already have the T cell response to the virus. So you're not impaired um, in that respect by these drugs, but you can't make antibody. So just receive a course of this antibody. This antibody is specially formulated so it does not degrade quickly. It could last up to a few months even, they're thinking it might last a four, five, six months. And then you would just repeat it. And it's intended as a preventive. So if you're infected, then this is not the drug for you. If you want to prevent an infection, then you might be eligible for Evusheld. Currently in our hospital, the effort is dedicated towards people on rituximab, indibilizumab, and ocrelizumab. Wow. So people with MS, people with NMO, people with rheumatoid arthritis and mycemia gravis taking these B cell drugs. Um, and the data is pretty strong that it works. Wow. So it helps so prevent it's infection. Approach. It's entirely designed as a preventive drug. Wow, that's so interesting. Let's go. Okay, so let's see. Oh, we're going to start with Leah. I received Evusheld on March 23rd before I went to Boston. I returned on March 28th, and the next day, Tuesday, I received my scheduled IVIG infusion, which was from the same lot number as last month. 21 minutes into the infusion, I began to experience muscle spasms, tightness in my left bicep. It spread throughout my left arm. It proceeded to involve my neck, right arm, and the rest of my torso and body. They stopped the IVIG infusion about after about one hour. They ran a bag of fluids and I had no change in symptoms, better or worse. However, my stomach and abdomen were extremely bloated. I went to the ER and the doctor had never heard of the medications I was taking, but diagnosed me with a moderate drug reaction. Could this be an interaction, should it be reported to the FDA and AstraZeneca? If the doctor doesn't, can I initiate a report? Could the interaction have caused a pseudo, caused pseudo symptoms? Any thoughts about the next IVIG infusion? It's a great question. I would say that after an infusion of Evusheld, it's not like you have a ton of antibody total. This is, it's distributed throughout the body and it's going to circulate in this patient. It looks like it circulated for five days doing its job. I think a lot of the reaction was probably from IVIG. Mm -hmm. IVIG is a huge dose of antibodies. It causes a lot of different side effects. In general, they're safe. In general, you're not going to see MRI lesions as a result of IVIG, no anatomical damage, but it can trigger quite a few different reactions. It can even cause a meningitis, a non-infectious meningitis. So IVIG is extremely potent, very good for MOG, but causes a lot of side effects. And that's probably what we're dealing with here, not anything related to heavy shield, my guess. Okay. Well, Leah, I hope that answered your question. Um, let's go to the next one. 20-year-old Mog Plus daughter has had three COVID vaccinations, negative B-cell test, positive T, 
DTAC test, should she get the fourth vaccine? Um, okay, so the answer to that depends on the age. The age is 20 years old. Right now, the CDC is not recommending the fourth shot for anyone who is younger than uh, 50 unless they are immune suppressed. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to see here. Um, I don't see that this person uh, indicated what medication this person's on. Okay. If they're on rituximab, then yes, a fourth shot is indicated. If this MOG person is on IVIG, which is not immune suppressive, then a fourth shot is not required. So it really depends on what this person is, is using for prevention of MOG attacks. All right, Terrence, I hope that answered your now, question. Now, I see here a negative B cell mm -hmm. test. I'm guessing she's on a B cell therapy. Okay. Um, because that is the best way to prevent a B cell reaction. So I would guess that that, problem, that person is probably using rituximab and would be um, uh, recommended to get a fourth shot, yeah. Okay. Teresa, how often would my daughter have to take heavy shots? On average, twice a year. Um, and it, hopefully after the pandemic wanes, um, maybe it won't be required long term. All right. How long are you recommending your patients wait to get their fourth booster, Moderna, after receiving heavy shots? Actually, um, the the timing of the vaccine, I think they ask you to wait 28 days, something like that. Um, there are a lot of questions around though, receiving Evusheld relative to your B-cell drug, like rituximab and oculizumab. And at Mass General right now, they're actually recommending the infusion on the same day. No kidding. Make it convenient. Okay. So your patient's coming in for rituximab, give them the Evusheld at the same time. Okay. The vaccine, you have to wait. The other thing you have to worry about is IVIG. Okay. For those of you who are on rituximab and you use IVIG because of um, hypogammaglobulinemia, because you have low immunoglobulin levels, then Evusheld might have to be given on a more frequent basis because the IVIG will recycle the Evusheld. Dr. Lady, how long is the Evusheld infusion? I don't know. I don't know how long the infusion is. That's a good question. All right. Thank you. Lisa, we have two questions from Lisa. Should Evishel be given along with the four COVID vaccines or in place of boosters? I have not yet gotten my fourth booster and not sure if I should still get that along with Evishel. I'm going to presume Lisa is on rituximab uh, because those are the people who are recommended for fourth booster shot if they're under 50. Anyone over 50 can get the fourth booster, the second booster of the fourth shot without um, immune suppression. If you're under 50, it's recommended for people with immune suppression. And the Evusheld is separate from that. Okay, so that's going to be in addition to. Okay. And then how long should she wait between Evusheld and the boosters? So that's about a 28, 28 day, days. A 30 day okay. wait. So what's your 28 days, that's the key here. All right, should you receive the COVID vaccines prior to Evusheld? I would think so. I mean, most people have gotten their COVID vaccines over the past you know, year or so, and um, Evusheld has only been available recently. So if you have not yet been vaccinated, then the suggestion is yes. And if you're on rituximab, you probably won't make an antibody response to the vaccine, and then you would be eligible for Evusheld. All right. Uh, just sticking with the timing question. So when would be the best time to get Evusheld if you get Rituxin every six months? Yeah, so that's, that goes back to how they're doing it at Mass General, just to make it convenient to reduce the amount you have to pay for parking, mm -hmm. which is a lot. Yeah. It would be at the same time. Okay. And so it's safe to do that. It's safe to do that. Safe and convenient. That sounds like a double win. I haven't had a flare since I was diagnosed in 2015. This is Pauline. I'm currently on Celsept 500 milligrams twice a day. I've recently started having similar symptoms since I was first diagnosed in 2015. Severe muscle cramp that starts in my legs and move up the chest like a full body cramp. Last about one minute or two, but seems longer. My current doctor wants to do an MRI. I just had one in November. Would it be necessary to do another one? Uh, good question. Not about Abby Shell, but might as well just answer it. 
Um, you know, this relates to whether or not there's new damage or symptoms from the previous damage. Really sounds like the symptoms are same, the same as, as previously. And my inclination would not be necessarily to do an MRI unless we don't have a better explanation. A better explanation would be a urinary tract infection, a COVID infection, a recent COVID shot, um, anything that can activate the, uh, change your metabolism, uh, change the pH or change your body temperature. So anything like that can bring out these old symptoms. And then if there's really, really nothing to explain it, yeah, you can get an MRI. All right. How will I know if Evershield is working? Evershield is working. It, it's entirely preventive. So the way they did it in the trial is they gave it to half of the people and they gave a placebo to the other half. And then they just asked how many people got infections in each group, the COVID infection. And the Evershield blocks much, much better than placebo did. This is amazing. I feel like it's yet another layer of protection, but a really solid one, right? It's very good. Are normal non-immunocompromised um, patients getting this too? Most are not. This is really intended for people who can't make their own antibodies. It's just as good as your own antibody if you're able to make one. Okay, so it's so designed for people like us. It's really designed to replace the antibody if you're not making it. That's so nice. Thanks to But remember, we also have Paxlovid and yeah. we have other acute treatments. Paxlovid is 90% guaranteed, keep you out of the hospital, keep you from dying. It's available at Walgreens, CVS, and everywhere else. So for patients who are acutely infected, that's an option. If you're not infected, you cannot keep it in your medicine cabinet. In the state of Massachusetts, you have to show documentation that you are currently infected to get Paxlovid, and you have to be infected within the first five days. So you can't just keep it in your mouth. I wish we could, right? That would make things a lot easier for everyone. Um, but outside of that, outside of an acute treatment, Evusheld is really the best way to prevent. Oh, this is really good news. Okay, what about cell stopped? Are they not getting every show? <laughs> not at my hospital. Oh. And there, but there's a lot of debate around it. Okay. Cell stopped won't keep you necessarily from making an antibody, but it will probably keep it keep you from having a maximal benefit to the vaccine, both antibody and T cell response. So cell stopped is a little bit broader in its activity. Mm -hmm. So for those people, we are recommending the fourth shot but not necessarily Evusheld, because if you're making the antibody, Evusheld is really redundant. Okay. Is there a way to get Evusheld approved for a child under five since there is no vaccine yet available to this group? She's on monthly IVIG. She hasn't received rituximab in over a year. Also, does IVIG provide any does IVIG provide any protection against COVID? Thanks for the question, Stephanie. So if the person who is not eligible for the vaccine and you want to give them the antibody, it's neutralizing. It would probably help prevent um, an infection. I don't know that it's been tested in that age group. Uh, so, yeah, that's another kids. kids. Now, the good news is that kids, even if they're immune suppressed, are probably not going to have a bad outcome from, from COVID itself. So I you know, in the balance of risks, I think you're dealing with two low risk situations, the infection, the infusion, I think they're both um, probably okay, no matter which way uh, this ends up. But one thing to consider is if you're on IVIG, it's going to recycle the FU shell too. So no antibody is safe from IVIG. IVIG does provide some protection against COVID because it takes about a year to make IVIG. Mm -hmm. So people were infected about a, over a year ago mm -hmm. at least. And so all those protective antibodies against COVID are net, now being packaged into IVIG. So it's <laughs> it probably amazing. is helpful. Okay, if your neurologist won't order Evie Sheld and says, I would need to see a neuroimmunologist, is this normal route for everyone? Can a PCP order it? It is very difficult to get Evie Sheld. <laughs> In the state of Massachusetts, um, it used to be entirely controlled by the state. Now they've given some authorities to the hospital and the hospital has decided they want to go for rituximab, ocrelizumab, and indibilizumab patients. A lot of my patients on CELSEP, I can't get them oh. So it, it is situation. and hospital by hospital. These are very expensive, very difficult to get drugs. Okay. Any side effects with that, Michelle? How are patients tolerating it? Any relapses? Have you heard of anything? I've not heard a thing. It, it's just an antibody against COVID protein. It shouldn't bind to anything in your body unless you get infected. Good. Great questions, guys. We're going through them as many as we can. So let's see. 
Is Evishield considered a vaccine and would it allow us to get into places that require you to be fully vaccinated? Thank you, Pauline. No, not nearly as good as a vaccine. It only provides the antibody. A vaccine triggers activity from your T cells, which are probably the best protection yeah. against the virus. So you're really only getting partial protection from that shell. It's so, good, yeah. but it's only partial. So you recommend for immunocompromised patients, we get the vaccine, the booster, and shell. That's right. You heard it from the guy himself. Well, for people under, 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 Okay, that's great. Thank you, Colleen. Maureen, my relative who has MOG AD recently had their COVID-19 spike protein antibody test. The tear came back well over, oh, the oh, titer. Sorry, the titer came back well over 2,500. This was great as he only produced antibodies after he received the third COVID vaccine shot in September. Should he get a fourth and when should he get it? Yeah, he should get a fourth. The antibody test is a great measure of just antibody production. And what we know from rituximab is there is a, is this person on rituximab? Oh, they didn't say. Okay, so a, a titer of, of 2,500 is very good. So if they're not on rituximab, it's sufficient. Okay. If they are on rituximab, a fourth shot is recommended. Wonderful. I got my fourth shot in February. I will say mentally I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm, I can handle this. All right, Sharon. My husband's oh, yeah. I mentioned one more thing about the fourth shot. It should always be at least four months after your third shot. Okay. So you can't, you don't want to get them back to back. So it's April now. If you had your booster in December, you're eligible now. Right. Okay. So you heard that, guys. Go get your fourth vaccine if you can. If you need it. If you need it. Um, but why not? My husband's first attack was five days after his first COVID vaccine. We didn't know at the time and he had his second vaccine. Within hours, he had another attack. Months later, he was confirmed to have NMO. He is now getting Evisheld at this, this month. Does this mean he should not get the vaccine in the future and just Evisheld? He is on rituxin right now and has had no flare-up so far. Yeah, people who have had flares or, or new disease after a vaccine, we recommend don't take that vaccine anymore. Okay. Because while there's nothing about that vaccine that's specific to Aquaporin 4 or NMO, there's something in him that is. And so for that person, Sharon and uh, Chen Wei, your husband should not get that shot anymore. Okay. Uh, you can get future vaccines of flu and anything else that you need in the future, but not this vaccine. So you can use Evusheld. Evusheld is not going to trigger an immune response. It's just going to supplement it. So it, it is safe to do. And, it, and for this person uh, who's already had two shots is not eligible for a booster, yeah, if you shall be kind of the next best thing. Okay. Will plasma paresis wash out the other shell? It will be five weeks since I received received it in my next plasma treatment. Yes, plasma paresis and IVIG will remove the every shell from circulation. You'd have to get another infusion. Okay. Dr. Levy's work. <laughs> we agree, we agree. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> Uh, so much love. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Should Evisheld be given nine months from the last rituximab infusion? Currently trying to switch from Octemra, but dealing with insurance. Two Octemra. Sorry. Yeah. So um, Evisheld can be given at any time relative to rituximab. It can be given at the same time. It can be given afterwards. There's no time issue regarding the, uh, the two, those two um, drugs. Same with Actemra. If you're getting Actemra, um, so Actemra is not, does not suppress an antibody response. Oh. So if you're on Actemra, you don't need a few shells. But if you've been on rituximab, oh, I see what she's asking. Uh, so if it's been nine months since your last rituximab mm -hmm. infusion, you might be able to make an antibody, but only after you get the vaccine. So it's not like the vaccine hangs around. So, so if you had your last rituximab nine months ago and you get the vaccine now, then you should be able to make an antibody response. And then you don't need to have your shelled. It's a lot of it's a lot mapping of, yeah. it out. You gotta map it out, guys. Make yeah. a timetable, do what you gotta do, but good information here. And looking at Evie Sheld and Rituximab, are we anticipating the same timeline timeline of six to eight weeks before infusion? Will the Evie Shield be supplemental to booster shots? Kind of answered it before, but yeah, so you can get Evie Sheld and Rituximab at the same time, but you should wait about a month from between a, a vaccine and an Evie Sheld infusion. 28 days, remember, pin it. 
What is the name of the drug if infected? Paxlovid, right? Yeah, Paxlovid. Paxlovid. P A X L O V I D. Paxlovid. There's another one, and I can't remember the name. It starts with an M, and it doesn't work. It's about thirty okay. percent uh, efficacy level, and it's it's probably not worth the effort. Wouldn't Paxlovid it be great, is the drug. great if Paxlovid was just available, so that if you had COVID, you just get that and. Yeah, but it's very um, restricted. You have to be infected. And if you're five days after the symptom onset, then they won't give it to you either. Okay. So it's early, early, on. early on, early on is when it's effective. What are the risks of triggering an NMO flare by getting the COVID vaccine? There are risks with any vaccine. We looked at a series of NMO cases in proximity to a vaccine, and there's definitely a statistical risk. However, if you are on treatment for NMO, that risk is gone. Okay. So if you're on rituximab or any other treatment for NMO, then then vaccines are actually beneficial because it prevents an infection, which is another book trigger for a flare. Definitely. I have kind of a dumb question. I'm not a science person, so forgive me. Um, if you get your first attack of NMO or MOG after a vaccine, the vaccine didn't necessarily cause NMO or MOG. It just brought it to life, right? The way to think of yes. The way to think about it is the disease was kind of brewing. Right. It's like an ember. Right. And then you take the vaccines like gasoline pouring pouring gasoline on the ember and flame the whole thing up. So did it cause the ember? No. Right. But did it inflame it? Yes. It like woke it up. It's like a sleeping Exacerbated volcano. It. Yeah. Because your immune system lives at different levels. And when you take a vaccine, your whole immune system gets activated in response to that vaccine. And if, in, if you have an NMO process in the background, yeah. it's gonna get activated too. And it might cross the threshold into an attack. So can we debunk this myth that I've heard and seen that a vaccine could cause NMO or MOG? It doesn't cause NMO or MOG. Okay. There's nothing specific within a vaccine to cause NMO or MOG. It really, it's, it's like a, um, a, it's a trigger and there has to be a lot of things going on in the background before a vaccine can do that. Okay. But a vaccine is, is more like pouring gas on a fire that's already lit. You heard that? The vaccine does not cause NMO or MOG. So I've, I've read that, I've seen it, and I'm like, oh, I don't think so, but let's confirm that. So that's good, we got that out of the way. Um, how long after a COVID infection would a patient be eligible again for Abby Shelf? That's a great question. Um, I don't know that there is a timeline like that. Um, Generally, before an IV shell in, in infusion, you want to be 30 days out from a vaccine and no fever and no infection and feeling well. Uh, so maybe when when you recover, two three weeks. Okay. I guess. Okay. I go on the 15th for my IV shell. Have you heard of many side effects? I have not. Yeah, I haven't heard them either. A few them. few things here and there, but generally well tolerated. Yes. Okay. Good. So if my daughter gets monthly IVIG, when and how often does she administer the Abishal? That's tough. Now, um, if you're on only IVIG and you're not on rituximab, then you're probably making a good response to the vaccine and you don't need Abishal. Mm -hmm. If you're getting IVIG because of rituximab infusions and your, your IgG levels are low, then that's a challenge because the IVIG is going to recycle the Abishal every single time. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wow. It's, uh, it's hard. Hard. <laughs> okay. Should IVIG then be sufficient to prevent a relapse from the COVID vaccine, even if the onset of the disease was triggered by another vaccine? Yeah. So remember, if you if if one vaccine triggered your event, if if your onset of disease was that vaccine, the idea is immune the immune system tends to associate things together. So if you were reactive against one vaccine, the idea is don't ever use that, that vaccine again. Okay. But the flu vaccine and everything else is going to be very, very different. And every infection that you get after that vaccine triggered attack is going to be different. Okay. So your immune system is going to respond to every single time. As long as you avoid that initial trigger, you should be fine. Okay. Uh, when there was a question okay. about the IVIG to, sufficient to prevent in okay. MOG, IVIG is very, very effective in preventing relapses to any vaccine. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's really good. 
what is the take slash efficacy of the COVID vaccine if you're on a Lizna? Same problem as rituximab and ocrelizumab. It does impair your antibody response. You still produce a very effective T-cell response, which is providing you the majority of the protection, but you would be eligible for an Evusheld infusion to just supplement that benefit from the vaccine. So it's a partial benefit. Plus Evusheld should get you to near full benefit. Now, um, educate me a little bit. Is this something that patients can ask their doctors directly or do you need a referral for it, a prescription? Like, how does that work? The way it works at Mass General is if a patient contacts me and says, hey, I'm on rituximab, I want to get Evusheld. I put in a quick order. Usually it triggers a phone call within the day okay. and a visit the next day scheduled visit the next day for an infusion or at least an evaluation. And this sounds like it can be done in the same infusion setting where we would get retoxic. Correct. Okay, okay, that's good. So we're just trying to, you know, paint the full picture here. So Evusheld is not recommended for patients on Solaris then. Also, should patients on Solaris under the age of 50 get a fourth vaccine? That is correct. Evusheld is not recommended if you're on Solaris because you're making antibodies mm -hmm. on Solaris. So you shouldn't even need it. Okay. And if you're under 50 and you're on Solaris, you do not need a fourth uh, COVID vaccine. That's correct. Can I get Avisheld before the fourth booster or should I get the fourth booster first and then wait 28 days for the Avisheld? Or does timeline even matter as long as I get both? Timeline does not matter. Just keep them separated by 28 days and you should be fine. Is there any data involving Evusheld and the Rituxin biosimilar, or since this is a biosimilar, it is anticipated to have the same impact? Same impact, no difference between Rituxan name brand and Rituximab biosimilars. If you have recently had a flare two months ago, should you wait for Evusheld? Is this the 28-day 28 28-day rule as well? I'm on Rituxan. Yeah, any inflammatory event, you wanna wait until your immune system is nice and calm before you get any new infusion. That makes sense. Should you get an antibody test after receiving Evichel to check for at the antibody level? It's going to be very, very, very high. Okay. So it's, but it's measuring an artificial antibody. But you can, you can call, you can check and confirm if you like, but unless they infuse placebo, it should be there. Okay. So we, uh, how long does an Evichel infusion take? Is insurance pre-authorization generally required. I think you're, does your insurance get charged for every show? I have no idea. Know. I haven't had it That's yet. a great question. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Sorry. Um, la, la, la. How long after a relapse would you recommend waiting before doing a third COVID shot or booster? One month. One month. 28 days, guys. 20. <laughs> Assuming that the relapse is gone and the mm -hmm. immune system is calm, it's been treated and things are on the, on the mends. that. Since every show lasts four to six months, would you recommend waiting closer to the middle or the end of that time frame to get the fourth Moderna, Moderna booster? I am on rituximab, had the third Moderna in August and every show March 3rd. I don't think there's a necessary waiting period. I think it's um, no matter um, when you get it, when you get the Evusheld relative to the booster, just 28 days difference, just to avoid any, um, any sort of side effects. I think it should be fine. I don't think there's any need to plan around it. Okay. For clarification, is Evusheld an injection or an infusion? It's an infusion. It's an infusion. Okay. I received the third vaccine and felt pretty sick for several days, fever, chills, shaking, but still did not produce a B cell response. Should I get the fourth vaccine? And they are saying another one in the fall. Um, can't tell if this person is on rituximab, but presuming yes. Yeah. Um, Got the third. So this is a great question yeah. because we looked at people who had side effects from the vaccine and we asked, do those people have a better response? It's not a study that we did, but a lot of people have looked into this because people say, oh, I had a very severe reaction to the vaccine. I know I had a good immune response. And it tends to happen. It's not correlated. Yeah. Antibody levels don't correlate. The risk of infection doesn't correlate. So just because you have severe reaction of the vaccine does not mean your immune system was effective in, in responding to the vaccine. Okay, there we go. I had a flu and pneumonia vaccine last fall and relapsed. I'm stabilizing now after starting cells up. How long should I be stable before doing a third COVID shot? Um, for the third COVID shot, I think you can take it now. 
I don't think, you know, the, for people who are on cell sets, the idea is that you want to take three shots in a row, okay. what, what, each one month apart. So you don't have to wait that, that first five month period to get your first booster if you're on cell set. So you do your three shots in a row, one month each, then you wait four to six months and then you get your fourth shot or booster. Okay. That's same with rituximab. If you're, if you're starting the vaccine on immune suppression, you get the first three in a row. That's considered your starting dose, the first three. Mm -hmm. If you're not on drug, your first two shots are, are a full dose. Okay. Should all the shots be repeated every four, four months, six months, or check an antibody level prior? I, I think it's somewhere between four and six months. Okay. But I don't know exactly. Okay. And, I, and I suppose an antibody level check is reasonable to just see if there's any left. And if there is, then you'll probably be fine. And if there isn't, then that might be a good reason to get the next infusion. And also, I mean, I think just like with everything else COVID related, everything is evolving all the time. True. So even this webinar may be a little bit obsolete in a couple of True. months because we just, things are changing all the time. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, after Shield, you can test for antibodies. My daughter's Shield was two injections, one in each hip. Did she not receive Evisheld? We were told it's two different antibodies, hence two different shots. I didn't know what that was. And it's injected in the hip? No. It's supposed to be IV. I wonder if, I don't know, two injections in the hip. The only injections in the hip would, would be like epidural, steroids, like uh, not epidurals, but yes, yeah, steroid injections. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know what that is. I would follow up and get more information. I asked a question about my daughter on Evisheld and monthly IVAG. She is on IV Rituxan. So I'm think, thinking one dose of Evisheld at the same time as Rituxx one month before monthly IVAG and then just pray for the best since monthly IV, IVAG will negate any benefit of subsequent Evisheld. It's true. The IVAG is going to remove the, it's going to recycle the Evisheld. So how much benefit you'll get from that first dose of every shell, I'm not so sure. It sounds like there are other people who got the injections in the hip. My doctor says every shell would be injected in the hip. Wow. Maybe they okay, don't do maybe. that at Mass General. Maybe. I don't wow. know. Wow. Well, thank you for educating us. I also two got shots in my thigh. In my thigh. Okay, two wow. injections. Wow. Our system gives Evisheld as two IM injections. Yeah, this is everybody responding. Oh, wow. This is great. Thank you, Good everyone. To know. Good to know. We didn't know this. Did Thank it, you right? for sharing. Okay. Um, my doctor said Evisheld will be given twice at my buttocks on my infusion day. Is that wrong? No. I mean, it sounds like a lot of people have the I, the um, intramuscular. And I bet the hip injection is really a muscle injection. Does that hurt? Don't know. Um, oh gosh, I can't even imagine an injection of my hip. And insurance was charged. Insurance was charged. Great, thanks for sharing Thank that, Leah. Sharing. From what I've read and been told by the nurse who called Abby who called Abby Sheld is actually two different shots given in each buttock at the same time. Oh, Did Leah? <laughs> she likes you a lot. Does not hurt. Okay, thanks, Leah. That's awesome. Okay, so guys, we have time for about three more questions. Um, so if you have any more, uh, definitely populate them, but we already answered that. Which, what is your recommended, recommendation on timing of the fourth vaccine vis-a-vis -vis rituximab? A while ago, you said it doesn't matter, as in theory, you should have no B cells. Others say time, it near time of next infusion. I think for convenience, that's just what people are doing. Okay, on rituximab, prior three vaccinations were Pfizer and Moderna. Should I get J&J &J for the fourth? If not, any guidance on the fourth? I don't know how people mix and match with J&J. &J. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Especially when J&J &J was not the first shot, because I know with J&J &J you should get Pfizer and Moderna as boosters, but I don't know about using J&J &J as, as the booster. I don't know the answer. Hmm. I would say just stick with Pfizer and Moderna at that point, right? Because it's not there's not enough data. Maybe. I don't know. I bet it's on the CDC website. I also had an injection in each buttock of the two ingredients of Abby Shell that NYU Langone. Yep. Oh, it was not an infusion. Okay, cool. Thank Good you, to everyone. know. Um, Sharon, I do have your question. Let me pull that up. Hold on one second. This was about. 
A contraindication on Evusheld was for patients with cardiac risk factors and or prior history of cardiovascular disease at baseline. I unfortunately fall into this category. Is there any more information available about this? Just reading about the cardiovascular events related to Evusheld, uh, causal relationship has not been established, but I, I understand the concern. Um, I don't know. I think that that's, uh, that's something I would have to look into. I think, you know, as with everything, you have to weigh the, the benefit versus the risk. If you live in a high COVID prevalent area, numbers are going up in New England again, um, it might be worth taking that risk. If you live in a low COVID area, I was just talking to my friend in Arizona who said that they have the lowest prevalence in Arizona that they had since the beginning of the pandemic. Wow. Maybe the risk is not worth taking there. Um, too shocked in the bottom. Tick, how do you say that? Tick, sir, give up. Yeah. MAB is monoclonal antibody. Correct. Antibodies. MAB at the end of a drug name is always monoclonal antibody. So in NMO, we have inebolizumab, satralizumab, echolizumab. Mm -hmm. And then MOG, there's one coming across. Okay. Since I get plexed every five weeks, should I bother with Evershelf again? Um, I mean, in theory, it's going to get plexed out. It's going to get removed. Um, so I, you know, we used to say that about rituximab, that if you're getting plasma exchange, then don't bother getting rituximab. And then the hematologist told us, oh, we, the way we do it is we, we do the plasma exchange and then we give another infusion of rituximab. And then that lasts for a few weeks and then they do plex again. And maybe they could do that with Evusheld. Hopefully. Oh, thank you, Teresa. Okay, I would say the last three, four minutes, if you want to tell Dr. Levy how much you love him and how great he is, then please, by all means, do so. No, this was super yeah. helpful, though. <laughs> we, we, we love him too, Dana. He's awesome. Look at that. So much love for Dr. Levy. We are very lucky to have Dr. Levy in our corner. He's amazing. He loves NMO and MOG patients as if we were his own. Um, if you're not in his Facebook group, definitely join it. I don't know. How, how do you have so many hours in a day? What's I your know. secret? I have a lot of help. You have a lot of help. Lot of oh, we love Dr. <laughs> Levy. He's the best. Well, you are, he's an international treasure, guys. I'm at the conference and everybody knows Dr. Levy here. You're a star. You're Bon Jovi. Let's see. I really appreciate you taking the time. Can't wait to see you in the appointment for June. <laughs> Do I just search your, yes, um, Christine, uh, you will see it uploaded both on YouTube and Facebook in a couple of hours. Um, make sure you subscribe to us so that you get the notifications. Hoping your trial gets to California soon. Which one? Uh, the site at Stanford. The Rosie? Rosemary. Thank you. You're amazing. We love you. We love you. We love you. Wow. 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 Awesome. Waiting patiently for Boston. Well, thank, thank you. you. What a good, what a great guy. What a great guy. <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone. This will be available um, very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.